I regard neoconservatism of the kind that Brett Stevens advocates as the most toxic and destructive ideological force in America. It's the ideology of Bill Kristol and David Frum and Dick and Liz Cheney, a bloodthirsty and sociopathic mentality that seeks to keep the U.S. in a posture of endless wars, one after the next, for the benefit of everyone and everything except the lives of ordinary American citizens. That they are as fanatical about ensuring that it is other families, and almost never their own, that have to fight in those wars and die in those wars that they cheer make them even more morally repellent to me than ever. And this disgust for neocons has been central to my worldview since I began writing about politics in 2005, largely motivated by contempt for the warmongering and regime change fixations and civil liberties assaults that this small but very influential faction of neocons had architected for America and deceived ordinary Americans through propaganda into believing that it was in their interest to support it. So my contempt for neocons began very early on and it endures to this very day. And for decades, this intense disgust of neocons was shared by virtually everyone who identified as a Democrat, a liberal, or a leftist, or something similar, as reflected by the rage when Brett Stevens was hired by the New York Times. My contempt for neocons and their ideology has never wavered. But now the opposite is true for most liberal pundits and liberal elites who now regard neocons not only as tolerable, but deeply admirable, even heroic. Liz Cheney was named by one of America's, as one of America's heroes for 2022 by Mother Jones, the left-wing magazine named after a socialist activist famous for her civil disobedience in pursuit of far left-wing causes. Now, the factor that caused liberals and so many leftists to so radically change their views of neocons from unbridled hatred to respect, affection, and admiration is the same factor that dictates all of their views, the only one they recognize as relevant, namely whether someone likes or hates Donald Trump. And since so many neocons, very notably and revealingly, early on viewed Trump as a grave threat to their agenda, let me say that again, since neocons viewed Donald Trump almost immediately in the 2016 election as a grave threat to their agenda, they converted themselves into Trump's sworn enemy, devoting themselves with a single-minded fixation into doing everything possible to sabotaging, maligning, and destroying Trump. That obviously wasn't true of all neocons. People like John Bolton ended up being hired by the Trump administration and working within it, although he eventually got fired, but it was certainly true of most. And that was all it took for liberals to immediately abandon their long-standing view of neocons as monstrous war criminals with an insatiable thirst for wars that are totally unrelated to the welfare of the American people and almost overnight view them as the opposite, as valued allies and wise thought leaders. That's why David Frum, George W. Bush's speechwriter, who penned so many of Bush's most harmful lies, doesn't write for National Review or Fox News, but he writes for The Atlantic. It's why Bill Kristol's social media exploded, due almost entirely to new liberal followers, and why he regularly has the red carpet rolled out for him, as though he's some honored, wise statesman by MSNBC. It's why Liz Cheney lost her GOP primary by a humiliating and record-setting 35 points while liberal columnists write payons to her greatness and moral character. Now, while it is the neocons' hatred for Trump that made liberals revere neocons, that is not why neocons have migrated back to the original Petri dish from which they first emerged. What explains that is that neocons who tend to be much more shrewd and clever than the liberals who they have deceived into revering them, understood well before Trump's emergence on the scene that the Republican Party was becoming increasingly hostile to their unlimited militarism and their thirst for wars. Wars that come at the expense of ordinary working class Americans who pay for those wars and die in them but receive no benefits from them. Starting in the second term of the Obama administration, neocons could see 
through things like the success that Ron Paul had with an anti-interventionist message deep in the primaries of Iowa and South Carolina, and who believed that Hillary Clinton would likely succeed o Obama and could barely contain their excitement over the prospect of a Hillary Clinton administration, neocons before Trump began signaling their intention to abandon the Republican Party, which had served as their host body for the entire war on terror and reinfect the Democratic Party, which they had decided to make their home for the near future at least. Now, despite this union, many liberals who have been trained to love most neocons now, like Frum and Crystal, still do harbor animus toward Brett Steven, Stevens, and that's largely due to his heresies on culture war issues, other kinds of religious, liberal religious beliefs, such, such, such as his opposition to some planks of gender ideology and his long-standing skepticism of climate change. Though neocons, if nothing else, always know where their bread is buttered, and Brett Stevens recently announced after taking a trip to Greenland that he's now largely on board with the liberal view of climate change, acknowledging that it really is the crisis that liberals have long been insisting it is. So there's very few reasons left for liberals to hate Brett Stevens. Other than his occasional opposition to the most extremist planks of gender ideology, at this point, their dislike of Stevens is basically just reflexive a kind of learned behavior they never unlearned. But all of that is highly likely to change. Stevens may very well now lose his status as one of the very few neocons whom liberals have not yet affectionately, affectionately embraced as a result of his decision today to write what is not so much a political column in the New York Times as it is a homage, a paean to the moral courage and general greatness of Joe Biden. To those paying little attention to U.S. politics over the last decade, or for those who have little capacity for thinking critically, it may seem surprising, shocking even, that a lifelong neocon would not only revere Joe Biden as our modern-day Winston Churchill, but basically endorse his re-election as president in 2024, something not even Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is yet willing to do when asked. Writing under this headline, quote, on Ukraine, Biden outshines Macron, Schlotz, and DeSantis. Stevens today gushed about Biden with such adolescent fanboy fervor that it would even embarrass Jimmy Kimmel and Stephen Colbert or the Washington Post team of fact checkers. We offer you just a few of the most illustrative paragraphs of the reverence Brett Stevens penned today for Joe Biden. He began by condemning French President Macron and German Chancellor Schlotz for the crime of trying to find a diplomatic resolution to the war in Ukraine, which Stevens finds so glorious and exciting. About those diplomatic efforts, Stevens writes, quote, these are preposterous suggestions. And then he unleashes his love and respect and homage to Joe Biden. Quote, that's the point, he wrote. Those who now argue that President Zelensky of Ukraine needs to be, quote, realistic or pragmatic. That is, that he should stop short of, of pursuing a complete Russian withdrawal from all occupied Ukrainian territories are proposing the solution they would never countenance for their own countries under ordinary circumstances, let alone during a struggle for national survival. That's why as the war in Ukraine enters its second year, I feel grateful for Joe Biden. Fault him all you want on many issues, particularly his gradualist approach to arming Ukraine, but on the most consequential question of our time, he has the big thing right. In other words, the one criticism Brett Stevens recognizes as valid of Joe Biden is that he hasn't armed the Ukrainians enough, quickly enough, or aggressively enough. But he says he got what in Brett Stevens' mind is the most consequential question of our time, whether Russia or Ukraine will rule various provinces in eastern Ukraine or whether they will be independent. That's real privilege talking, being a New York Times columnist and believing that the most important issue is who rules various provinces in eastern Ukraine. And for Brett Stevens, the fact that Joe Biden has gotten this right more than any other world leader means that he deserves 
a second term. He goes on, quote, as for prudence, musing openly about the need for eventual negotiation harms Ukraine's solidarity and morale, both key factors for its survival and success. An overwhelming majority of Ukrainians want to retake all the territory seized by Russia, including Crimea. That political fact should weigh in the mind of Biden's foreign policy team. Public support for Ukraine is eroding, particularly among Republicans. And conservatives who know better, including Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, are shamefully hedging their bets. President Biden likes to say that the United States will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. But that promise could expire on January 20th, 2025, if he doesn't win a second term. He owes it to his own legacy not to hazard what is potentially the most historic accomplishment of his presidency on next year's race. Now, there's a lot packed in there into those claims, beginning with the fact that he says a majority of Ukrainians, an overwhelming majority, want not only to have the war end, but instead want to expel Ukraine, uh, Russia from all Ukrainian territory, including Crimea. Now, the idea that NATO is going to support Ukraine for it to successfully expel every last Russian troop, including from the areas of eastern Ukraine where overwhelmingly people identify far more with Moscow than with Kiev, who far more would rather either be independent or under the rule of Putin than under the rule of Zelensky, is utter madness. But even more unhinged is the idea that Russia would just stand by and allow Ukraine and NATO to take back Crimea. And Brett Stevens' assertion, and that's all it is, is an assertion that the vast majority of people support Biden's vision that they want to fight until the very end, until every last bit of territory is, re is recovered, including in Crimea, you'll note has no citation. He doesn't cite a poll. He doesn't link to a study. That's just something that he wants to believe. It's a nice fairy tale to believe. And so he just asserted it. All Ukrainians are behind me and Joe Biden. They want to fight this war until the very end. Now, it's very hard in a war zone. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update. Catch our full shows for free live weekdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rumble and join our Locals community at greenwall.locals.com for all of my written journalism, exclusive after-show Q&As, and more.